Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. We're going to continue our study in the book of Nehemiah and pick up where we left off last week. And let's begin at verse 15 to the end of the chapter. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, they all returned to the wall, each to his work. Uh, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. Those who carry burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side where he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears and the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who follow me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. Let us pray. Father, as we see the history of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem, and the restoration, really, of the city of God, after the conquest and exile, pray that we would see the, not only your purposes in hand at that time in history, but the fact that you are always at work in history, including ours today. In Jesus' name, amen. We saw in our last sermon on Nehemiah that the enemies of the people of God were on every side of Jerusalem. And this ring of enemies was comprised of the forces of Sambalat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites. It's possible that the Persian authorities might have taken Nehemiah's side in this since he had the authority to rebuild the walls from the king. However, in Ezra 4, around a dozen years earlier, an edict from King Artaxerxes had stopped the construction. <coughs> Nehemiah certainly didn't want to take the chance of some reversal of the policy that allowed them to build. The work did not stop, but Nehemiah took defensive measures. And we observed this last week, but it's in this passage as well, that Nehemiah combined spiritual activity with military preparedness. We see that, of course, they prayed, they relied upon the Lord, but they all, and they persevered in the work, but they also had military preparedness. They carried the shields and bows and spears and coats of mail. Um, Derek Thomas illustrates this action with the name of the Christian magazine Charles Spurgeon started in 1865. It was called Sword and Trowel. The name was derived from Nehemiah. The builders of build and had their sword at their side. Uh, Derek Thomas wrote, The sovereignty of God is not an excuse for negligence and dereliction of duty. Whether the issue is prayer, evangelism, or the need to engage in defensive or aggressive warfare, both are important with prayer, of course, coming first. J.I. Packer, citing William Temple, writes, Wherein we think our real work are, is act, our activity, to which prayer is an adjunct, our praying is our real work, and our activity is the index of how we have done it. John Bunyan, of course, author of Pilgrim's Progress, said, pray often. The prayer is a shield of the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. 
we think about these enemies surrounding Nehemiah, Scripture summarizes our spiritual enemies as the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, Lady Jane Grey, uh, I'll say more about her in a moment, but you may remember she was Queen of England for nine days. Uh, Edward VI, who was a Protestant, had appointed her to be his successor. Uh, he knew that the rival successor was Mary Tudor, who wanted to turn the nation back to Roman Catholicism. Uh, she ruled for nine days, unfortunately the Privy Council um, turned against her and she ended up being imprisoned and ultimately martyred. But she said, deny the world, defy the devil, despise the flesh, and delight yourself only in the Lord. And she was beheaded by Mary Tudor when she was 17 years old. And she's quite a remarkable figure. As I mentioned, I'll say something a little more in a moment. Steve Lawson said that every Christian is called to be a soldier of the cross. We must advance to the front lines of spiritual warfare. There can be no conscientious objectors, no spiritual pacifists, no part-time warriors. And this was not just another building project in terms of rebuilding the walls and restoring Jerusalem. They were rebuilding the city of God, the place of worship, where God had said, I will put my name at that time in redemptive history. Now the opposition from the world came from Sambalat and Tobiah's evil consortium, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and so on. And whenever we set forth a Christian worldview and hold that, that view ourselves, we can exp always expect attacks on our disconformity from the culture around us. David Wells said that worldliness is what makes sin look normal and righteousness seem odd. Another commentator said that worldliness is sustaining an interpretation of the reality that excludes the reality of God from the business of life. Francis Schaeffer in addressing this issue uh, titled his historical book and video series, How Should We Then Live? And throughout that series, he pointed out the societies without a Christian foundation cannot sustain themselves and they crumble. We're thinking about the Olympics in France recently and of course some of the uh, terrible things that were done in the opening ceremony, a lot of them depicting the French Revolution which had its philosophical base in the Enlightenment, a denial of God that was trying to be an espungement at the time of everything Christian from society. And in fact they eliminated a seven day work week, tried to add a ten day work week, that didn't go so well. And uh, mocked Christianity every chance they got and of course you know how that ended up with the reign of terror and the guillotine and so forth. Harry Blamers said to think secularly is to think within a frame of reference bounded by the limits of our life on earth. It is to keep one's calculations rooted in this worldly criteria. To think Christianly is to accept all things with the mind as related directly or indirectly to man's eternal destiny as the redeemed and chosen child of God. The opposition from the flesh is seen in Nehemiah and the fact that some yielded to the threats and suggested the work was too much to them. In fact, in the next chapter we see a, a great outcry that is a yielding to the weaknesses of the human needs. We still feel those kinds of pressures as we seek to live a Christian life in a fallen world. They may not be military enemies surrounding us, but they can be real enemies. Ward Byron, the brilliant poet, spent his life in a mad search for pleasure. Near the end of this life in despair, he wrote, he wrote, The thorns I had reaped are the tree I had planted. They had torn me and I bleed. I should have known what fruit would spring from such a tree. And in another book, J.I. Packer instructs on this. He said, Any idea of getting beyond conflict? 
outward or inward in our pursuit of the holiness in this world is an escapist dream that can only have disillusioning and demoralizing effects on us as waking experience daily disproves it. What we must realize rather <clears throat> is that any real holiness in us will be under a hostile fire at all time just as our Lord was. The devil is not mentioned in this passage, but ultimately he is the one behind the opposition. He is always opposing the people of God. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, we read earlier about the devil being on guard against him. Paul wrote, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, <clears throat> but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. All three of these enemies are in Nehemiah 4. Also notice in this passage that even though Nehemiah does good military preparation, he still affirms that the battle belongs to the Lord. In verses 19 and 20, And I said to the nobles and to the officials, to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall. Thor them one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Notice they still worked. They still continued. But they were prepared militarily. And then there was a statement, our God will fight for us. Nehemiah knew and affirmed to the people that God would fight for them. But the people still carried out their duties. This is very similar to a battle which took place when Israel was in the wilderness after the deliverance of Egypt. In Acts 17, they came across Amalek in the wilderness and they ended up fighting against him at Rathadim. In verse 9 of Exodus 17, so Moses said to Joshua, Choose through us men and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While well, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Joshua and the men really did the fighting. They were down there in battle. And when they came back, they were probably covered in the blood of the enemy with sweat and dirt from the battle. But ultimately, the battle was determined by Moses on the hill. It was determined by God's blessing, God's power. In our Christian lives, we are involved in our sanctification, in our perseverance in the faith, in our Christian growth, but ultimately it was God who was at work in our lives. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, in speaking about this subject, it's not occurring, not dealing with salvation there. Therefore, my beloved, as you have already obeyed, so, not, so now not only in my pr presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. 
We are involved. We apply ourselves to those means of grace. We pray, we read, study, and memorize the Bible. We worship and, and so on. But it is God who gives us the will and the desire to do those things. In fact, an important prayer for ourselves is for God to increase our desire for His Word and for worship and to be in His presence. Derek Thomas commented on verse 20, this was not to be taken as a sign that there was nothing for them to do, that they need not worry at all about the threat against them because God would take care of it without them having to lift a finger. Sovereignty doesn't work like that. The promise of God's activity and superintendence is neither a signal for inactivity or passivity in our part. In the providence of God, He works and we work too. Nehemiah perhaps was thinking also of Psalm 127, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. James Boyce wrote that everything in this whole universe begins with God, is accomplished by God's agency, and exists for God's glory. But if that is true of the inanimate universe, the world of plants and trees, of suns and planets, of quasars, quarks, and black holes, it is certainly true of salvation. It is true of you. If you are a Christian, you exist because God created you. You believe because He worked faith in you and sustains it in you by the power of this Holy Spirit. He does this that you might live to His glory now and indeed forever. Left to ourselves, we can do nothing. Even as saved people, we would fall at the first wisp of temptation or the first blast of Satan's death-dealing blows. But because God is for us, we can stand firm and triumph. This is why Thomas Kelly writes in the hymn, Keep us, Lord, keep us cleaving to Thyself and still believing, till the hour of our receiving promised joys from Thee. And J.I. Packer writes on verse 20, The God we serve is, as Nehemiah declared, great and awesome, great in wisdom, grace, faithfulness, and power and awesome in his habit of exposing his servants to difficulties, dangers, toils, and snares out of which then he delivers them. To be a fellow laborer with this God and share in his works of love, blessing, and redemption in this world is a marvelous privilege, the greatest that life affords. The work may be tougher than we bargain for, we should still feel the awe and glory of being God's colleague. And never forget that as someone once said, one with God is a majority. Or that as someone else said, while the wages of serving God here may be scrappy, the pension is out of this world. <laughs> Nehemiah knew that the work of building the wall was the Lord's will. He had prayed and seen God's providence allowing him even to come to that area and in God providing the funding and financing for the project. He didn't have a doubt that God would support them as they finished the project. Verses 21 and following, So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears in the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor men of the guard who followed me, none of them took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon in his right hand. When you read that, I'm reminded of a good friend of mine. He was once one of our elders in the church here. Um, he has taught with me many times in Ukraine, Jim Carmichael. Some of you know Jim. He was in Vietnam as a Marine in the Battle of Kazan, 77-day battle. 
was one of the few survivors of his unit. And he said, for 77 days, I didn't take my boots off, didn't change my clothes, didn't brush my teeth, didn't do anything. It was constant alert. Very similar. None of us took off our clothes, each kept a weapon at his right hand. They persevered. They pressed forward with the construction, even in the threat of an attack. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 fits this history very well. We read it earlier. And referencing back to Hebrews 11 and that great roll call of faith, the heroes of faith in that chapter, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who through the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne in God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We have the great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. This is not teaching the idea that people in heaven are watching us like spectators in an arena. It is simply referring to those who came before in the Old Testament and had faithful lives. It is referring to those mentioned in chapter 11 who had great victories through faith and also experienced suffering through faith. It is those to whom the writer said in Hebrews 11:38, men of whom the world was not worthy. Think about some of God's people of whom the world was not worthy. The Jews in Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah were not worthy of Jeremiah. Many of those in exile in Babylon were not worthy of Ezekiel, Daniel, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember that of all the captives that were present when Nebuchadnezzar commanded them to bow and kneel to his golden idol, it was only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that refused to bow. Paul was beheaded and Peter crucified upside down through the amusement of Nero. Nero and the Roman authorities were not worthy of those ambassadors of Christ. Nero should have bowed before Paul, not in worship, but in respect through who he represented. Remember Paul said in Ephesians 6.20 that he was an ambassador in chains. He was an ambassador of the Lord God Almighty. Usually an ambassador is treated with honor, and here's Paul in chains. Paul represented the king of kings. And there are many examples of martyrdom and faithfulness, difficult lives down through church history. John Calvin writes on Hebrews 12, 3 and 4, There is no reason for us to seek our discharge from the Lord, what other service we have performed because Christ does not have any discharged soldiers except those who have conquered death itself. In fact, you may remember that Calvin and William Farrell had first been in Geneva when it had voted to be a Protestant city. They experienced lots of resistance. It's a longer story, but they were kicked out. Calvin went to Strasbourg and worked with Martin Bucer. He referred to his three years in Strasbourg as the happiest in his life. And there was a cardinal, Cardinal Sadoletto, wrote an open letter urging Geneva to come back into the Catholic fold. And Calvin answered the letter in a published short work, reply to Sadoletto, and as a result he received an invitation to go back to Geneva. He wrote of this, there is no place under heaven that I am more afraid of. I would rather submit to a hundred other deaths than to that cross on which I would perish a thousand times every day. When he did decide to return, he said, I offer my heart a slain victim and sacrifice to the Lord. 
And until the, that, just the last few years of his life, he was not a citizen of the city and received abuse and ridicule and attack constantly. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the first thing we need to realize is the Christian life is a warfare. That we are strangers in an alien land. That we are in the enemy's territory. This is the warfare you and I have to wage. I mentioned Lady Jane Grey earlier. She had received a Renaissance humanist type of education. She had studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew with John Eilmer and Italian with Michelangelo Florio. Through the influence of her father and her tutors, she became a committed Protestant. She also corresponded with the Zurich reformer Heinrich Bullinger. When she was 13, get the age, 13, she wrote to him and said, I've mastered Greek, but I'm having trouble with Hebrew. What study materials would you recommend? <laughs> Of course, as mentioned, she had been named by Edward VI as his successor. She reigned for nine days. The Privy Council of England changed sides and proclaimed Mary as queen on July 19, 1553, and deposed Jane. Mary Tudor was made queen, had Jane put in the Tower of London, where she was martyred at the age of 17. She willed her Greek New Testament to her sister Catherine, who also read Greek. Might mention Elizabeth, you know, Queen Elizabeth that came later. She also read her Greek New Testament every day. Some of these people kind of put us to shame and <laughs> these things, but here's a 17 year old inscription It's part of it. She told her sister, live still to die, that you by death may purchase eternal life and trust not that the tenderness of your age shall lengthen your life. For as soon, if God call, goeth the young as the old, and labor always to learn to die. Defy the world, deny the devil, and despise the flesh, and delight yourself only in the Lord. Be penitent for your sins, and despair not. Be strong in faith, and yet presume not. And desire with St. Paul to be dissolved and to be with Christ, with whom even in death there is life. Be like the good servant, and even at midnight be waking, lest death cometh and stealeth upon you as a thief in the night. You be with the evil, you be with the evil servant found sleeping, and lest through lack of oil you be found like the five foolish women, and like them that had not the wedding garment and then be cast out from the marriage. Rejoice in Christ as I do. Follow the steps of your master Christ and take up your cross. Lay your sins on his back and always embrace him. And as touching my death, rejoice as I do, good sister, that I shall be delivered of this corruption and put on incorruption. Think about that, a 17 year old young woman. Well, she knew the battle lines, and that's just a portion of the inscription, and the others equally in depth. She stood to the faith. In fact, in the story, Mary had sent her new archbishop, Catholic archbishop, to try to convert her. He tried to convince her of various Catholic doctrines, and she basically in the debate destroyed him every time. And then it's like, okay, no progress here, take her head off. But she understood that the gospel was at stake in what she was holding. Our battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil starts with being truly redeemed through faith in Jesus. There is no other way of salvation except through faith in Jesus. It is Jesus who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There's that universal negative, no one comes except through me. And there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ,
Throw yourself upon him. Believe in Jesus. Transfer trust in anything in your life to him alone for your salvation. If you are in Christ, realize the enemies against which you stand. Be on guard. Be prayerful. And ask God to strengthen you and give you the will to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your care in our lives, for all that you do for us, how you support us, sustain us, and you are at work causing us to persevere in the faith. We pray that you would give us a deeper hunger for your word, a deeper desire for the things of you, a desire to pray and to worship and to not grow weary in well-doing. We are grateful for where you have brought us to this point in our Christian lives. We pray for your continued work in our lives. In Jesus' name.